Uh, good day. My name is Kieran O'Malley. <coughs> I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and I'm uh, currently working in Dublin, in Ireland. I work at uh, Our Lady's uh, Children's Hospital in Crumlin, and I also have a consultation office in a place called Charlemont Clinic. And within that context, I see uh, consultation patients with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, actually from all across Ireland. So that's the context of my current work. I've worked actually with fetal alcohol patients for over 20 years. Yeah, the whole issue of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, it's sort of uh, a continuing debate within the field. Um, ironically, it was a term that Ronnie Hegerman and myself coined back in 1998 when we were involved in Chevy Chase and a, a co interagency coordinating meeting on fetal alcohol. And both of us worked in the intellectual disability field and we were actually talking about psychopharmacology, but in, in discussing together, you know, both came to looking at fetal alcohol as a, as a spectrum disorder, not unlike autistic spectrum disorder. And then <coughs> Anne Streisgut and myself wrote a paper on long-term consequences and psychiatric sequelae in, in the seminars in neuropsychiatry. The alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder really is the much more common presentation. It's the presentation that as a practicing psychiatrist is what you deal with. And so what you're, what you're dealing with is <coughs> a developmental psychiatric disorder which has its origins in the organic brain damage caused by prenatal alcohol. And uh, it's not a mental retardation condition which is often misunderstood, but this is really a condition that uh, there's really been a paucity of research and intervention it, it's a complex brain injury condition in which the patients have a history of an effect on alcohol in the developing liver and kidneys and heart and critical areas and in, in, you know, for side effects of drugs and also the developing brain. And so it's, you know, anecdotal experience shows that these patients are complicated in their reaction. Yeah, the area of psychopharmacology is sort of complicated in this uh, condition because there's actually really no scientific studies done. I mean, I've been personally involved in some analysis with um, psychiatrists looking at differential effects of psychostimulants and, and marrying it with the previous research done in, in behavioral pharmacology of Hannigan back in the early 90s. But uh, really, there's no systematic assessment of medicines. I, there's a cultural difference in the use of medicine with this acquired brain injury developmental disorder, which is in the North American context, it's not uncommon to, to see patients who are on five, six medicines, whereas in, in the UK or the Irish context, uh, physicians are much more conservative. So um, their one or two medicines are more likely to be used. My, my, my clinical experience over a, 20 years is that one or two medicines actually can suffice and I think it becomes really complicated when you have five or six medicines which seems to be more the norm within the North American context and I think from a diagnostic point of view you know child psychiatrists and, and child psychologists probably there needs to be um, validity studies on their diagnostic concordance which is a really important issue when you're uh, giving interventions. On the positive side though, you know, and I speak from dealing with these patients for many years, I'm not a masochist, I think it's a complicated condition, but you can actually really dramatically change people's uh, functionality. A person with intermittent explosive behavior with, with ADHD and distractibility that uh, uh, pervasively affects how they function in school or a person with a, a mood instability you know, medicines uh, have a role in modulating these behavior and making the patient more functional and making the patient then amenable to other modalities of treatment, such as language therapy for the person who has problems in communicating and blurts things out and misunderstands social situations. And if you rein the, their, their impulsivity in, then they're able to take language therapy or sensory integration therapy for the child with regulatory disorder or individual therapy, uh, whether a cognitive behavioral approach or even nonverbal play therapy, all uh, are 
are married and done concordantly with medicine. So I think uh, we're really at the beginning of that. But there are models. I mean, NIH did studies on multimodal therapy and ADHD, so you don't actually need to reinvent the wheel. You, you can um, borrow from previous scientific studies that have clearly shown that if you're treating ADHD, you need psychostimulants in the context of teacher training and parent training. So, so that's a common approach that would, would have its value in, in the fetal alcohol uh, world. And also with depression, it's more complicated because you have brain injury underpinning it, but, but uh, uh, the mood is lifted and the person is more e eligible or easier, I should take, to, to take sort of a cognitive behavioral approach to help them understand their sort of negative thinking. What is amazing, really, if you think of the, the pervasiveness of alcohol in society, in all societies, that it wasn't until 1968 when Le, uh, Lemoyne, a pediatrician working in Nantes in a muscadet growing area, wine area of France, you know, patiently waited till he had, had a, you know, 127 infants with, with characteristic facial features and linked that to alcohol. You know, it's astounding when you think of it. And it really, those facial features, you know, which, which captured initially as a snapshot, but they only were, uh, you know, alcohol exposure in a small time. The truth is that uh, the brain is washed in alcohol for the whole of pregnancy. And you, you come out of the shoot with this really complex neurodevelopmental psychiatric disorder, which presents as regulatory problems as an infant, as ADHD inadequately described as sort of six-year-old, as mood disorder, explosive disorder, but has its roots in, 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 a, in an acquired alcohol brain damage. I really think that no amount of alcohol is safe. And, and I think the disinformation will continue. But obviously I'm biased because I'm somebody who treats these patients and continues to hear stories about, but I thought it was okay. I thought, you know, it only was a problem in the first three months. I didn't think, you know, the last three months uh, was okay. And I think we owe ourselves, I'm speaking as a doctor, but I think as a society, to protect, you know, the next generation and the next generation's generation. As a sort of child neuropsychiatrist, whatever that is, but somebody who's interested and trained in neurology and, and the whole, I suppose, the relationship of the brain to behavior, and not just behavior, but psychiatric syndrome presentation. Uh, I mean, I'm biased, but I really think it would be uh, beneficial for this population um, at a lifespan level, from children, adolescents, but also young adults, to, to have more psychiatrists entering into their sort of primary um, diagnostic frame. At the moment, the historical uh, roots and diagnosis are, are, are really driven by um, a facial measuring uh, preoccupation, but that really doesn't capture the alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, which is 80 to 85 percent of patients with prenatal alcohol, that's what they present with. And, and so what you're really needing is to train child psychiatrists and adult psychiatrists in neurodevelopmental psychiatry. And that's a, a specific type of psychiatry and, and it relates to the, the psychological development, language development, but also brain development. And this, in this context, it, it involves an understanding of the changes in the developing brain due to the insult of neurotoxic alcohol affecting not just the developing structures of the brain, such as the corpus callosum or the hippocampus cerebellum, but also the, the, the critical modulation of the developing neurotransmitters, serotonin, GABAergic agents. And, and uh, we are in an era that people are understanding more about this. So hopefully uh, we are in an era that, that maybe uh, psychiatry uh, as a specific specialty, maybe married with pediatric neurology, will, will understand and see that this is a common condition, one in a hundred live births. It's not a 
It's not a rare bird. This is a condition that's transgenerational. And really at this current moment in time, in 2011, really it's untreated from a psychiatric point of view in any systematic manner. So I think psychiatrists, both in Europe and in, in, the, uh, in um, North America, probably need to have some systematic training. But I think they also need to be involved in a primary diagnosis. At the moment, what seems to happen, or what does happen, is the diagnosis is made traditionally in a dysmorphological setting. And then um, the patient sees a psychiatrist disconnected probably from the initial clinic or geographically or in town um, with a multitude of complicated psychiatric undiagnosed problems. And there's a disconnection, uh, which is ironic because it's a disconnection syndrome. <laughs>